Awesome. We'll go ahead and start our uh, one o'clock session. Glenn Merzer began his career as a stand-up comic, playwright, and screenwriter. He has authored and co-authored a dozen books on health and the environment. His latest books are Own Your Health and Food is Climate. But the proudest accomplishment of his career came last night over, over dinner when he convinced me, Tyler Kanchazeski, uh, to pledge to go vegan. I pledge never to go back. I do not want to upset Glenn. So uh, now I'm going to hand it off to Glenn. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. I've got to turn the whole world vegan, so that's one down. Almost eight billion to go. All right, let's start with my true-false test on health. True or false, if a person swallows a coin, it's a good idea to pat him on the back. That's false. It's a mistake to encourage that sort of behavior. True or false, eating cheeseburgers will actually increase your electrolytes. That is true. They give them to you in the hospital. True or false, smoking too much weed diminishes your capacity to reason. That's true. It's false. Okay. So uh, there's going to be some uh, bad news in my presentation today, but the good news I call a convenient truth. Um, does anyone know who the first vegan in history was? Who? No? No, the first vegan was, was a caveman. What happened here? First vegan was a caveman who discovered that it's easier to sneak up on a plant. Uh, we don't know too much about him. We know that he tried to convince the other Cro-Magnons in the cave to go vegan, and we know that he was not well liked. Oops, this goes fast. Um, before I begin, you're advised to consult your physician before making any dietary changes. Um, now, I always, I've written several books on health. I always have to begin with a disclaimer like this, which is only fair, only right, because I am not a doctor, I am not a dietitian, I am not credentialed at all. So if I'm going to have the nerve to recommend the, the way people should eat, I should at very least have the decency to say, consult a professional first. But believe it or not, doctors are not trained in nutrition. Um, this is a quote from a Harvard professor. The fact that less than 20% of medical schools have a single required, nutrition in, required course in nutrition, it's a scandal, it's outrageous, it's obscene. I agree with the Harvard professor. Now, how could that possibly be? How? How could medical schools not teach nutrition? For most people, most of the time, nothing will affect your health more than the food you eat. So just think about the stunning, mind-boggling, almost criminal incompetence of medical schools in not teaching nutrition. Why wouldn't they teach nutrition? So I've analyzed it, and I've come up with what I think are the only four possible reasons. I don't believe this. Medical schools are not run by fools. Medical schools are run by highly accomplished, intelligent, ed educated people. And you'd have to be very foolish not to see a, a correlation between food intake and obesity, for example, or after 70 years of science, not see a correlation between what you eat and heart disease. So this couldn't possibly be the explanation. Second possibility is that the medical establishment isn't concerned with wellness. In other words, maybe doctors view their role as being in a sick care system. You get sick, they intervene with pharmaceuticals or with surgery. And they leave the wellness stuff to aromatherapy practitioners and meditators and yoga practitioners. 
But that explanation doesn't fly either because even if you have that narrow view of the role of a doctor, that they're only there for sickness, well, nutritional therapy is often far more powerful than pharmaceutical therapy. So why would they not want to learn about how to, how to uh, provide nutritional therapy? So that explanation doesn't fly. A third possibility, medical schools are corrupt. Now, there is some evidence for this. About half of the budget of medical schools comes from the pharmaceutical industry. But still, I don't believe it. I don't think there's some un unholy alliance between the pharmaceutical industry and, uh, and medical schools that they meet in secret locations and they secretly plot how to keep Americans fat and sick so that they could all make a lot of money off them. I don't think most doctors want you to be sick. I think most doctors are decent people who want you to be well. So I don't think corruption is the reason. I think the reason is number four. The medical establishment belongs to the same culture we do. Most doctors are highly successful members of their community. They're pillars of their community. They are thriving within this culture. They're not in the business of challenging the culture. People eat what they eat. It's part of the culture. And in fact, doctors eat the same way we do. 40% of doctors are overweight, 20% are obese. So they're clearly not in the business of challenging the culture. They're part of the culture. Now, we hope we're finally emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic that's killed over a million Americans, so about six and a half million people worldwide. Um, and we've all heard endless arguments about masks and vaccines. Uh, but we hardly ever hear about the role of animals in the pandemic. First of all, like most pandemics, this one is zoonotic. zoonotic. A pathogen spread from an animal to a human, and this is likely to happen with animal agriculture when you have crowded populations of animals in contact with human beings. Second of all, this pandemic targeted the obese. And, the, and those with comorbidities. In other words, it targeted those who were already made fat and sick by the animal food rich Western diet. But what if you contracted COVID and you were on a plant-based diet? Well, they did a study. A, a very reputable journal, BMJ Nutrition, did a study and found that those who followed a plant-based diet had 73% lower odds of moderate to severe COVID. Now that's, that's not necessarily being on an optimal whole foods vegan diet. That's just a plant-based diet, whatever that means. Probably a lot more plants, a lot less animal foods, but not necessarily an optimal diet. What if you were on an optimal whole foods, low fat vegan diet? Well, they've never done a study of that. But Dr. Kim Williams has asked around. Dr. Williams is the past president of the American College of Cardiology. And he has asked his colleagues, other doctors, nurses, medical professionals, and other hospitals, has, has anyone come across anybody on a whole foods, low-fat vegan diet who has died of COVID? And as far as he can tell, and he's been asking for a long time, the answer is zero. Now think about that. If there were one million deaths from COVID, and if people on a whole foods, low fat vegan diet, or even 1% of the population, you'd expect 10,000 deaths in that, in that uh, cohort. But in fact, maybe, just maybe, there have been zero. Now imagine if Pfizer came up with a pill that reduced your risk of severe COVID from somewhere between 73 and 100%. And imagine if the only side effects of that pill were reduced obesity, reduced type 2 diabetes, uh, reduced heart disease, reduced inflammation. There would be a Nobel Prize in medicine for whoever invented that pill. But there isn't a pill. There's broccoli. And there isn't big money in broccoli. Now, has anyone ever heard the leading lights of the pandemic, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Walensky, Surgeon General Murthy, 
Have you ever heard any of them, when addressing COVID, say, here's what I recommend. I recommend that everybody go on a whole foods, plant-based diet. I guarantee you that that study from BMJ Nutrition crossed their desks. 73% lower chance of severe COVID at least. If, if they had given that advice, and if Americans had taken that advice, presumably they could have saved three quarters of a million lives, at least. So why wouldn't they do it? I've analyzed it. I've come up with a few reasons. I don't believe they're fools. I think these are highly intelligent, highly accomplished people. Come on, they're not fools. Second possibility is, yes, they all did go to med school where they learned to discount nutrition. But with so many lives at stake, I don't think that's much of an excuse. I don't think that's the reason. Are they secretly making money off COVID drugs? I mean, I know people have a lot of different opinions about Dr. Fauci, but I don't believe that they are corrupt and they're secretly making money off COVID drugs and they want people to be sick. I don't believe it. I think the reason is they belong to the same culture we do and they don't want to challenge it. Imagine if Surgeon General Murphy had held a press conference and he said, here's what I recommend. I recommend you don't eat meat, don't eat dairy, don't have oil, don't have fried foods, and eat a low-fat, whole foods, vegan diet. Do you think he'd last another 24 hours in the job? Do you think the president would be happy with him? Do you think there might not be a lot of blowback from the food industry? That's why he doesn't say it. He's not in the business of challenging our culture. He's thriving within our culture and he wants to keep his job. Now this is a picture of me, my high school yearbook picture, me in 1973, the year that I went vegetarian and began unknowingly challenging my culture. I wasn't trying to challenge my culture. I was just a kid, but I was trying to save my own life, not because I had any health problems, but because people around me were dying like flies. I had two uncles die the year before when I was 16, one uncle was in his 40s, one was in his 50s, both died of heart disease. My mother had angina, so she, could, uh, she would get chest pains walking up a flight of stairs. Uh, I didn't know my grandparents. They were dead before I was born, mostly of heart disease. And, uh, uh, you know, on my father's side of the family, almost all the men died in their 50s. I didn't want to be middle-aged at 25. So on the first day of summer vacation after my junior year of high school, I began my vegetarian diet. I had an English muffin with jam for breakfast. And the phone rang, and it was my old buddy Dave. And I said, Dave, congratulate me. I've become a vegetarian. And he said, congratulations. That, that's great. Since when? And I said, well, you, you know, since breakfast. And he laughed at me, and it's a good thing he laughed at me because it's now been almost 50 years without eating dead animals. The next person I told was my mother. I, I said, Mom, I'm a vegetarian. She said, well, what took you so long to figure that out? I said, well, what the hell does that mean? She said, well, when I was pregnant with you, I was determined to raise you as a vegetarian. But the doctor talked me out of it. He said, your brain wouldn't develop and your bones wouldn't develop and you'd be small and weak if you survived at all. So he scared me. That doctor actually managed to harm me before I was born. So I said, but mom, this doesn't make sense. You're not a vegetarian. Dad's not a vegetarian. Sheila, my sister, she's not a vegetarian. Why in the world were you gonna raise me as a vegetarian? And she said, because Glenn, when I was pregnant with you, you felt like a vegetarian. Next person I told was my father. This is him with my grandparents who I never knew. My father was a moderate in all things. He believed always in moderation. He said it was fine with him if I was a vegetarian as long as I ate meat once in a while. Next people I told were my obese aunt and uncle. They were probably each about 100 pounds overweight. And they were alarmed at my dietary gambit. They were worried that I wouldn't survive it. And I wanted to say to them, you're worried about me? Look at yourselves. But of course, you can't say that. So they said to me, where are you going to get your protein? And I ad-libbed. 
I said, well, I guess from cheese. And then stupidly, that's what I did. For the next 19 years, I ate no animal products at all, no meat, no fish, no eggs, but I did have, I didn't drink milk, but I did have cheese just as a safety valve to get my protein. And then in my mid-30s, I started getting chest pain. And I thought, oh, this is unfair. I have such terrible genes. My family has such high cholesterol, such terrible genes for heart disease. Here I am, I've been a vegetarian almost 20 years, and I'm getting chest pains. So did I go to the doctor? No, I didn't. I don't like to go to the doctor. What I did was I thought about it, and I said, well, I'm not eating meat to prevent heart disease because meat is full of saturated fat and cholesterol. And what is cheese? Cheese is saturated fat and cholesterol. Cheese is liquid meat. So I gave up the cheese. That was 30 years ago. I became a vegan, and I've never had any chest pain since. Now, when I became a vegan, I became a shy vegan, by which I mean I didn't try to talk to anybody else about their diet. I wasn't trying to convince anybody else. I was doing it for my own health. Sometimes I hear that rephrase back to me, so you were just doing it for selfish reasons. No. What is selfish about trying to take care of your own health, right? I mean, there might be somebody out there who loves you, or maybe two or three or four people or more. There's nothing selfish about taking care of your own health. I would argue the opposite is true. There's something profoundly selfish about eating cheeseburgers. And so I was a shy vegetarian until I met my friend Howard Lyman. Uh, and Howard's story was that he was a fourth generation cattle rancher from Montana turned uh, vegan and animal rights activist. And uh, I learned from Howard what he had done on the land in his cattle ranch in Montana. He had used industrial agriculture techniques. He had crowded his cattle together, shot them up with antibiotics, used um, herbicides and pesticides on the land. He had turned the land the, the rich, loamy soil that he had inherited, he had turned it into dust. The, he had killed off the worms and, and the birds in his area. Uh, and he, I, I realized how much animal agriculture was a threat to the earth. And so with animal agriculture being such a threat to the earth, I realized that it isn't enough for me to be a shy vegan. I have to try to turn the world vegan, and uh, you know, there are almost 8 billion people in the world. We have Tyler now is on our side, so that's good. Uh, but trying to turn 8 billion people vegan, as you could imagine, it's a strain on me, and I've developed a hernia. Um, we are, Let's congratulate ourselves. We are the fattest, sickest population ever to walk planet Earth. That's quite an accomplishment. Uh, and when President Obama took office, um, there was a popular cry that we have to do something about health care. And President Obama instituted Obamacare, and I'm sure you all remember, uh, I'm hearing of, of phone ringing here, or an alarm going off, which someone could shut that off. Uh, President Obama instituted Obamacare, which I'm sure you will recall was very controversial, but it has become popular over time. And when uh, President Obama instituted Obamacare, obesity in America stood at 35%, that's an alarming number, 35% of Americans were obese. But Obamacare gave health insurance to over 20 million Americans at the time, and now over 30 million Americans get their health insurance through Obamacare, 
And presumably, therefore, over 30 million Americans have greater access to health care. And obesity has gone from 35% to 42%. It's gone up 20%. So clearly, access to medical care is not a very good strategy for fighting obesity. Maybe that's because doctors do not study nutrition. Now, we face an array of crises in this country. We, we have, despite our obesity, we have food insecurity that's widespread. We have a climate that's punishing us with wildfires in the West and droughts, 100-year storms that come every two years, it seems. We have a pandemic that has killed more Americans than any other population in the world. Uh, so where did all these crises begin? Is it even, even possible to identify an underlying cause? Well, that's the kind of thing you might, that's the kind of thing you might discuss with your friends over dinner. Some might blame the Republicans, some might blame the Democrats, some might blame socialism, some might blame capitalism, but what if the real problem is dinner itself? What we eat is all bound up with our culture. Americans eat 8 billion chickens per year. And as you know, there are all kinds of chicken fast food joints. There are chicken jubilees. Chicken wings, for some reason, are associated with watching football. Turkey is associated with Thanksgiving. Hot dogs with baseball games. All these animal foods are part of our culture. And we are punching way above our weight in consumption of animal foods. We are first in the world in poultry consumption per capita, fourth in the world in beef consumption, 12th in pork, 17th in dairy. Where did we learn to eat like this? Well, from our mothers and our fathers and our families, our extended families. Uh, now, of course, there's nothing wrong with breastfeeding. But there's a point at which you should stop drinking milk if you have any self-respect at all. Even rats know to be weaned at about four weeks. And yet humans go on drinking milk and eating milk products for their entire lives, and, and it's the milk of other species, something they would never do if it involves suckling. Now, we were fed with love by our parents. And the foods we were fed with love are the foods we grew attached to. And we grow, we grow attached to the culture we're raised in. Everyone wants to feel part of their culture. Everyone wants to feel included. Everyone wants to feel proud of their culture. And if anything about that culture is insane, we don't notice it. From within the culture, we can't see it. It looks normal to us. Now, I want you to look at this image and ask yourself if this looks normal to you. If it does, let me tell you what stands behind this image. Grain is grown almost always in a fertilizer-intensive, pesticide-intensive, um, herbicide-intensive way that degrades the land and pollutes the streams and rivers and oceans. And that grain is then transported to feedlots, where it's fed to animals that are held together in crowded conditions that produce pandemics. And when the animals are fattened enough, they are then slaughtered. And some of that flesh then finds its way to fast food joints where it is slathered in sauces and condiments so that you can't taste the foul, rotting flesh, which would otherwise be unpalatable. And people eat that and give themselves heart disease and diabetes and strokes and autoimmune conditions and obesity. And they order these foods from these air traffic controllers you see here who are wearing masks, not because, not to avoid the fumes from the vehicles, but because of a pandemic that was started halfway around the world 
by other people eating animals. Does this look normal to you? Because if it does, this is what's normal to people in Spain, the running of the bulls in Pamplona. And you can think of one example after another of cultural insanity. Notice how this one also involves bovines. Whoops. Here's another cultural insanity. There are cultures that actually have royal babies. Photographers love taking pictures of them. Baby tossing has been in practice for hundreds of years. Babies are tossed from the top of a temple to, to men who catch them in blankets. That brings good luck. Finger amputation has been uh, practiced as a form of atonement for one's sins. Uh, ritual killing, human sacrifice, has been around as long as civilization has. If ritual killing sounds particularly ancient and barbaric to you, consider that it's also the price of admission to college fun. For the last 50 years, there, there's been at least one death, usually more, from hazing across college campuses around America. Young, healthy people go to college and drink enough rum until they die of alcohol toxicity. But this is permitted because this is part of our culture, the culture of the Greeks. And this is part of our culture, and this is part of our culture. I don't know what stage of making chicken nuggets this is, but just look at this filth. How could anyone possibly want to eat this? We house tens of thousands of chickens in these warehouses at the risk of starting a pandemic that could wipe out half of humanity. This is considered cage-free birds. We have mechanized killing. Now, do we do this? Do we slaughter animals because we need to? Of course not. We slaughter animals because it's normal. It's part of our culture. People get together for barbecues. We have July 4th. Grills. We have, you know, we have uh, uh, friends coming over for pool parties, and and they they have hot dogs on the grill. Everybody does it. These animal foods are advertised on television. It's normal. We do this because it's normal. And so it must be healthy for us. People think. Well, let's disprove once and for all that there's any benefit to eating animal foods. So let's look at the science against eating animals. First, all you have to understand is macronutrients, and the case is closed. What are the macronutrients? Well, they are carbohydrate, protein, fat, and sometimes people include in this list as well fiber and water. These are the five things you need to live. Now, is a potato a carb? Well, potatoes have carbohydrate. They also have protein, they also have fat, they also have fiber, they also have water. Potatoes are not a carb. Potatoes are a food. Potatoes are a root vegetable. Potatoes are a healthy food and they're very satiating and they're, they're therefore an excellent food to help you lose weight. Now if potatoes were a carb, think about this. Does anyone know how many, how many calories in a gram of carb? Did I say that right? Yes, how many calories in a gram of carbohydrate? Four. How many calories are there in a gram of potato? One. So if potatoes are a carb, how come they only have one? Not four calories. The answer, the fiber and the water. The fiber and the water count. The more science we, we do, the more we learn the benefits of fiber. And you don't want to be dehydrated, so why not get water from your food? Let's analyze meat. Is there any carbohydrate in meat to fuel your cells? Glucose for your brain? No, none. No carbohydrate at all. No fuel in this so-called food. Yes, there's protein. There's excessive protein. Excessive protein is a burden on the system. It's a burden on the kidneys. You don't want excessive protein. The body can't store protein. And the protein in animal foods is carcinogenic, as has been proven by T. Colin Campbell in the China study. Uh, it's particularly sulfuric protein high in the amino acid methionine that's been linked to cancer. So it's no carbohydrate, too much and too much unhealthy protein, too much fat, including too much saturated fat, no fiber. We know all about how, how important fiber is 
and yet there's no fiber, and there's a little bit of water. So you just look at the macronutrient profile. Why in the world would you eat this? It's got nothing. How could it possibly be good for you? No carbohydrate, bad protein, bad fat, no fiber, a little bit of water. That's not a good food. So another thing it has in it, many people don't know it, but for example, in Walmart, all their meat is injected with a little solution of salt and flavorings to try to hide the foul taste of the rotting flesh. All right, if macronutrients isn't enough for you, you ha we have comparative anatomy. Whoops. Scientists uh, analyze how much they, they analyze the, the, and compare and contrast all mammalian carnivores like the cat, omnivores like the bear, herbivores like the rabbit, and they analyze things like the, the gape of the mouth and the dentition, the shape of the jaw, the movement of the jaw, the presence or absence of enzymes in the saliva, the hydrochloric acid, in the stomach, the length of the intestines, the presence or absence of claws. And in every category, not most of the categories, every category, humans line up with the herbivores, not with the omnivores, not with the carnivores. So comparative anatomy proves that we are herbivores. Now, the one objection you always hear, what about our canine teeth? So let's take a look at our canine teeth. Because why would we have canine teeth if we weren't meant to eat meat, right? So let's compare. That's the canine teeth of a tiger and our canine teeth. I mean, that's a linguistic confusion, not an anatomical similarity, right? You can call these claws, but they're not. All right. So, macronutrients, comparative anatomy. How about evolutionary biology? We know where we've evolved. We know who our evolutionary cousins are. They're the great apes. And so the chimpanzees and the orangutans and the um, gorillas are all practically card-carrying vegans, our cousins. They're 95 to 99% on a plant-based diet. Now, I have to admit, for accuracy, that about a dozen times a year, the male chimpanzees will go into the trees and they will trap a monkey. They will snap its neck. They will, they will tear apart its living flesh. And the male chimpanzees will give some of that flesh to the female chimpanzees in exchange for sex. Now, that is appalling behavior. I am not going to condone that at all, but they're not doing it for nutritional reasons. They are doing it to get laid. When I was single, I did far worse. All right, then we have 70 years of scientific studies. Going back to the Framingham Heart Study, which for, what, more almost 75 years now, has shown a, a relationship between cholesterol meat and meat eating and heart disease. We have at least dozens, maybe hundreds of studies of, on blood pressure that all show blood pressure goes down when you eat more plants and it goes up when you eat more dead animals. So we know that blood pressure is responsible, is responsive to a plant-based diet. Uh, and there were even studies that showed that the worst blood pressure was in the meat eaters, and then better blood pressure in the vegetarians, and the best blood pressure in the vegans. Now, blood pressure is dispositive. I mean, once you know what diet gives you the best blood pressure, that's, that closes the case. I mean, why in the world would we be designed to eat a diet that gives us high blood pressure? I don't think there's one quack in America who argues that there's something good about high blood pressure. So we know the diet that gives us healthfully low blood pressure, and it's the plant-based diet. The most meaningful nutritional studies in my mind are the work of Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn. Uh, and I say that because a lot of nutritional studies are confusing. I've heard a lot of people say, you've probably felt this way yourself, Oh, there are so many studies, you hear one thing one day and one thing the next day. Well, a lot of studies are themselves confusing. 
if you have a study of 20,000 people self-reporting what they ate, and then they try to draw conclusions about what's healthy in their diet, well, you can twist and change that data any way you want. I mean, if you have a self-reporting study of 20,000 people, some of them are going to be vegans who eat a junk food vegan diet and don't get enough fruits and vegetables. Some of them may be meat eaters who eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. So everything gets confused. I think the, the correct way to do nutritional studies is the way Dr. Esselstyn does it. He puts his people on an optimal whole foods, plant-exclusive diet, and he has worked with patients with severe heart disease. So we know what would become of them if they didn't change. We know what their uh, mortality would be. He did a first a study, with a small study with 24 people and achieved remarkable results and reversed uh, heart disease in all who were compliant with his, with his protocol, which was most of them. He got some criticism that it was a small study, so he did a larger study. 198 heart patients, 44 of whom had already had heart attacks. And in the three and a half year study, most of them were compliant, 177 out of 198, and there was only one cardiac event. Uh, angina was reversed in almost everybody. And of the 21 non-compliant patients, 13 experienced cardiac events, including two deaths. So we know that the optimal diet to escape heart disease is a low-fat, whole foods, vegan diet. Imagine if, if somebody who, who uh, advocates meat eating, there are a few quacks out there, quack doctors out there who advocate meat eating. Imagine if they had proposed Let's do a study and take severe heart patients and put them on a sausage and butter based diet. I don't think anybody would fund that study. In other words, we know, we all know what causes heart disease. It is not in dispute. There's an epidemic of type 2 diabetes in America. We know what causes diabetes, type 2 diabetes. We know that it's the fatty American diet. The fat blocks the insulin receptors in the cells so the sugar can't get into the cells and stay, stays in the bloodstream. This is elementary. Everybody knows this except maybe not doctors who don't study nutrition. Now, when I was a kid, uh, well, the population of the United States has approximately doubled since I was born. And the incidence of type 2 diabetes in America hasn't just doubled, it's gone up by 20 times in my lifetime. So that's the kind of health crisis we have eaten our way into. And so the answer to type 2 diabetes is the exact same answer as heart disease. It's the whole foods, low fat, plant-based diet. Autoimmune diseases. This is a study that showed that a healthy gut from the healthy fiber in a vegan diet protects against autoimmune disease. And so the same diet protects us. Cancer. Processed meats have been identified as a class one carcinogen. Everybody accepts this, that pastrami and these other processed meats are terrible for you. They're, they're a class one carcinogen, just like cigarettes. But T. Colin Campbell, the author of the China study in his new book, The Future of Nutrition, he wrote, the statistical distinction between processed meat and unprocessed meat was minor and likely of little or no importance. In other words, in Dr. Campbell's opinion, really all meat perhaps should be considered a class one carcinogen. Dairy has been linked to breast, ovarian, and prostate cancer. And we know what gives us protection against cancer, antioxidants, fiber, and a low-fat diet. There are no antioxidants in animal foods, no fiber, and almost all animal foods are high fat. So the anti-cancer diet is the whole foods, low-fat, sugar-free, vegan diet. So here's the science, again, against eating animals. We know from just from looking at macronutrients, we know that there's no point to eating flesh. Comparative anatomy teaches us that we are herbivores. Evolutionary biology teaches us that we should eat a diet closer to what our evolutionary cousins eat. 70 years of scientific studies 
prove over and over again the value of a plant-based diet. There are no legitimate studies showing any benefits to flesh foods. You will never come across a study that fried chicken prevents cancer. Um, and finally, there's the experience of thousands of independent-minded doctors like my friend Steve. Steve Luenda uh, was a hard-working physician in California. He was about 80 pounds overweight. And he was practicing the standard of care. He's a good, caring doctor who was trying to help his patients. And he found in his first few years of medical practice that he wasn't helping anybody. He would prescribe uh, metformin for the, the patients with type 2 diabetes and statin drugs for the patients with high cholesterol. And they would get side effects, and he'd give them drugs for the side effects, and drugs for the drugs for the side effects. And nobody got better. And he was very depressed because he felt that he was not helping anyone. And then he, he and his wife were on a road trip, and they were playing a, an audio book uh, that was advocating the plant-based diet. And his wife said, well, why don't we try this? And Steve said, I think if this worked, they might have mentioned it in med school. But she talked him into it. So they went on a plant-based diet. He lost 80 pounds. And just as importantly, he started practicing as a plant-based physician. He, now he sits down with his patients, and he talks to them about what they eat. And he tries to persuade them to eat more plants or go on a plant-based diet. And now he helps most or all of his patients, especially those who comply with the diet. He gets, he reverses type 2 diabetes, he reverses heart disease, he saves people's lives, and now he has a re rewarding career. And he's not the only one. There, there's the American College of Lifestyle Medicine with thousands of doctors like Steve who practice this way. And the Plantition Project with thousands of health practitioners who practice this way. There is not an equal and opposite uh, movement on the other side of the nutritional divide. There are not thousands of doctors who have learned the benefits of sausage and butter-based medicine. That doesn't exist. All, the only movement in the world of nutrition is this one. It's advocating eating plants and not animals. And so with all this science, this overwhelming case that there's no reason to eat dead animals, what does our government recommend to us? They used to call it the food pyramid, now they call it the my plate. Two cups of fruits a day, three cups of vegetables, seven ounces of grain, six ounces from something called the protein group that includes animal flesh, eggs, peanut butter, beans, peas, and lentils. I bet you didn't know that the lentil was cousin to the egg. Uh, and three cups of dairy. Now, is there any science at all that if you had three cups of fruit instead of two, it would be bad for you? Or four or five cups of vegetables that it would be bad for you? Is there a single study that eating five cups of vegetables will cause you to fall down or something? So why, why are they limiting those foods? What if you had not seven ounces of whole grains, things like oats and millet and brown rice? What if you had 10 ounces or 12 or 14? What harm would that do? Well, no harm, of course. There's not a single study that if you go above those limits of those healthy foods that anything bad would happen to you. So why are they limiting it? I'll tell you why they're limiting it, because they're recommending three cups of dairy, for which there's not a single scientific study of any legitimacy that shows that there's any benefit. Three cups of dairy, if that three cups of dairy is cheese, that's 1,500 calories. There isn't room for more than two cups of fruit or three cups of vegetables. Not if you're having 1,500 calories of dairy. Now, in that so-called protein group that doesn't exist in real life but exists in their minds, in that protein group, well, if you eat the lentils, six ounces, you might get 50 calories. But if you eat the animal flesh, and you slather it in sauces to hide the taste, you might get 500 calories. So that makes a little bit of difference, doesn't it? But they don't tell you that. 
So you see, now I told you before that I don't believe that doctors are corrupt. And I don't believe that medical schools are corrupt. And I don't believe that Dr. Fauci and Dr. Murthy and Dr. Walensky are corrupt. This is pure corruption. This is pure corruption. Who created this chart, these recommendations? The United States Department of Agriculture. Why do we rely on the United States Department of Agriculture for our nutritional device? Who's client, who are their clients? Their clients are growing the dairy and the cattle. So this is pure corruption and this is pure nonsense. And there isn't, an, and I talk about seven ounces of grains, there isn't one ounce of science behind it. So why do we believe that nutrition is a controversial subject? There's not a conflict between science and science. There are no studies showing any benefit to flesh foods. There is a conflict between science and culture. And nothing affects our health more than the ability to breathe. We're, and we now face a climate emergency. Now we all know what causes climate change. Climate change is caused by the burning of fossil fuels, right? No, in fact, Fossil fuels, the burning of fossil fuels is the second leading cause of climate change. The leading cause of climate change is animal agriculture. Now you might hear sometimes people say that animal agriculture is responsible for 15% of greenhouse gases. It's much more than that, as I'll tell you in a minute. But the reason that the leading cause of climate change is animal agriculture is something called carbon opportunity cost. What if we didn't graze the earth? Know how much of the earth we graze? 37% of the non-ice land surface of the earth is grazed. Another 4% is used to grow feed for animals. That's 43% of the non-ice land surface of the earth that we are dedicating to growing meat. What if we face the reality that we're not meat eaters, we're human beings who are plant eaters, and we stop the grazing? What if we rewilded 43% of the earth? Well, what would happen, it has been studied, if just 40% of that land was returned to forest, we would sequester enough carbon dioxide to get us out of the, uh, the climate emergency and in fact restore us back to pre-industrial levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. In short, there is no way to solve this problem uh, this crisis, the climate emergency, unless we end animal agriculture. And of course, that means also ending industrial fishing that is destroying the oceans. Why are we being misled? Why is animal agriculture rarely discussed? And most of the leading climate spokesmen like Al Gore concentrate solely on fossil fuel burning. Well, there's the visual bias. You can see the smoke coming out of the smokestacks. You can't see the methane coming out of the cows, but the methane is 130 times as potent a greenhouse gas as it is emitted into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. I'll tell you something else you can't see. You can't see the forests that are no longer there, that have been cut down for the animals. None of us has ever seen the Sahara forest but there used to be a Sahara forest before it became the Sahara Desert. And when did it become the Sahara Desert? 10,000 years ago. When did human beings start agriculture and begin animal husbandry in that part of the world? 10,000 years ago. It might not be long into the future when, we, we're ta when we're talking about the Amazonian desert. We're currently cutting down the, Ama uh, the Amazonian rainforest for Hamburg. Um, my friend Dr. Silas Rao did a paper that showed that animal agriculture, if you include carbon opportunity costs, is responsible for at least 87% of greenhouse gases, and this was a peer-reviewed published paper. But Silish left out of his calculations a number of other factors. He left out animal respiration from 25 billion farmed animals. 
He left out pasture maintenance fires. These are fires set annually on grazing operations to burn everything the cows don't eat. He left out the bottom trawling of the oceans, which are kicking up sediment, acidifying the oceans, and reducing the carbon capture of the oceans. He, he left out decreased sequestration from diminished phytoplankton populations due to industrial fishing and diminished sea forests. Now, these are all difficult things to quantify, and uh, I think that's one reason Silish didn't include them in his paper. And anyway, I think he felt once you get to 87%, maybe people should pay attention. This is a NASA fire map. These are pasture maintenance fires set on one day across the globe. Notice the big brown patch from the Sahara across to the deserts of the Middle East, the Thar Desert in northern India, the Gobi Desert in China. This is where agriculture began. And so we're destroying life on the planet. Animal agriculture and industrial fishing are the leading causes of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, deforestation and desertification, ocean dead zones, biodiversity loss, water scarcity, and pandemics. So let's compare social goods. I'm not holding any brief for fossil fuels, but fossil fuel burning, you have to admit, gives us some social goods. I'll bet a few of you drove here today in a vehicle that burns gasoline. We heat our homes and cool ourselves with fossil fuel burning. We cook with fossil fuel burning. We manufacture goods by burning fossil fuels. There are an awful lot of social goods associated with the burning of fossil fuels. What's associated with eating animals? Heart disease, diabetes, cancer, obesity, pandemics, uh, pollution, destroying our streams and rivers, destroying the earth. There is not a single social good associated with eating animal foods. So where should we concentrate our efforts? The subtitle of my book, Food is Climate, is a response to Al Gore, Bill Gates, Paul Hawken, and the conventional narrative on climate change. So why don't these three leading spokesmen on climate ever talk about the fact that animal agriculture is the leading cause of climate change? Well, I've, anal I've analyzed it. They're not fools. I think we could all agree these are highly intelligent men. I don't believe they're corrupt. Bill Gates has more money than he could spend in a thousand lifetimes. Al Gore is a very, very wealthy man. He does have a few cattle on his land. I assure you that the few peanuts he may be making from the cattle on the land isn't influencing him. Paul Hawken, as a young man, once turned down a fortune in order to continue running his small business. They're not corrupt. They're part of the same culture we are. And so when you're part of a culture that, that eats meat, you don't question whether or not we need the grazing land. And they're not going to question it. They're not in the business of challenging their culture. In order to heal, we have to leave our wounds alone. If you ever went to a doctor to dress your wound, what does he say to you? He, says, he or she says, go home. They never say go home and scratch it, do they? They say go home and leave it alone, it'll heal. We are self-healing mechanisms. So is the earth. And so in order to heal the earth, we need to leave as much of it alone as we can. If we stop eating animals, we could leave more than 80% of the earth alone. 70% is the oceans. If we stop if we end industrial fishing, we leave 70% of the world alone. And then if we stop the grazing, we leave 43% of the remaining surface of the earth, the land surface, we leave it alone. It adds up to more than 80%. This is a once barren landscape in India in 2002 that was grazed. Four years later, that's what it looks like after it was left alone. And so one diet, our natural human diet protects against heart, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, cancer, inflammatory diseases, food scarcity, water scarcity, climate disaster, deforestation and desertification, ocean destruction, and biodiversity loss. 
isn't that convenient? Isn't it convenient that by simply eating human food, by merely returning to the natural human diet, the foods we were designed by nature to eat, that we could solve so many of our problems and lead longer and healthier lives? All we need is a global transformation to a vegan diet. And the only thing that's stopping us is culture. Now, you may be saying, but wait a minute, isn't culture a good thing? I mean, what's, that's what the tourist industry is all about, right? Go around the world sampling different cultures. We always hear about wonderful things about different cultures. And so, sure, we can celebrate cultures, but we have agency. We can say yes to ahimsa and no to baby tossing. We can say yes to flamenco music and no to bullfighting. We can say yes to fraternity and sorority gatherings and no to hazing. We can say, I love you, mom and dad, but you fed me the wrong food. That's OK. I forgive you. I, I have no trouble forgiving my parents for serving me the wrong food. They didn't know better. That's the food they were fed. But we have to break this cycle immediately if we're to survive on the planet. The reality is there is no place for this in civilized society. And there's no place for this. And there's no place for this. For, this. for us as humans, with the world at stake, the ultimate question is, can we grow up already? That concludes my presentation. These are my books, Own Your Health and Food is Climate. And I have, what, maybe two minutes for any questions, or we can just wrap it up. Thank you. Yes. I figured this out. My husband and I are about a year older than you. Uh -huh. So we start, okay, we started vegetarian in 2012. Maybe by 2014, we ve were vegan. We've been vegan. Uh -huh. But I have to admit, culture is a big deal with our, our friends, family members. People tend to want to exclude us. I've noticed right. this, unless I invite them over or we bring food over. What can you say to those of us who have been vegan for quite a while and you know, you, you give me hope, and I know we're doing all the right thing, and we're doing our part. Right. But it's really hard to get people out of that culture. Um, I mean, even my doc, even our doctors. What? What do you? Uh, you've started it in 1973. I'm sure you've come across this. What do you recommend to us? You know. It's a good. It's a. It's a. It's a good question because it's the hardest. There really is nothing hard about going vegan. There's so many resources out there, so many cookbooks, so many, you know, YouTube videos. There's nothing hard about eating human food. There's nothing hard about getting up in the morning having oatmeal and berries. There's nothing hard about having tempeh instead of having hamburgers. There's nothing hard about having pasta and beans. Um, but there's something hard about dealing with Aunt Rosie. That's the problem. The problem is other people, and they invite you over for dinner, and then, yes, sometimes they start to exclude you, because, you know, uh, they, why, why invite a vegan to a, a barbecue, right? Uh, and everybody has to decide for themselves to, to the extent to which you want to try to convince people, you know, um, you know, nobody likes to be a proselytizer. I, as I said, I was a shy vegan in the beginning. I wasn't interested in what other people eat. I was only interested in my own health. But the planet is at stake. So to the extent that you can do it in a way that doesn't offend people, you have to try to convince people. Um, and then you could, you know, if people aren't going to invite you to their home for the barbecue, you can invite them to your home for a plant-based meal. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of people only come to this after they get sick, which is a shame. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. I'll be signing my books out there. And thank you to Tyler, our new vegan. <laughs>